beautiful song sung very beautifully tonight. Thank you for that uh, good message and song. And thank you for being here tonight. I do not take it for granted that you would be here on a Sunday evening. Uh, everyone is already getting geared up for whatever you have this week, but it's all right. That will come soon enough. All right. We can, th this day of rest and worship's not over yet. Uh, I, I uh, was it last night? I don't remember last night or this morning at some point. Um, I think it was this morning. Uh, I woke up and I thought, you know what? I'm so glad for Sundays. I'm so glad that I'm not allowed to do a lot of things. Uh, on Sunday. Uh, we've been working, uh, trying to get our fence put back up after the tree, the large tree that John removed from our backyard, uh, you know, tore down and snapped off the poles like that far under the ground. So you got to get down there. And anyway, I've uh, been working on that several days and uh, woke up this morning. I'm glad I don't have to go out there and work on that. So I don't know what it is that you're, you're glad you got out of, uh, but you're here, so I'm glad for that. Uh, we want to, uh, I want to read some scripture tonight, and uh, this evening uh, I'm going to try to, uh, to answer some questions. I've had, uh, this week we've had a lot of discussion on the topic of forgiveness. And uh, you, many have, have talked to me and, and many of your groups and uh, even outside of groups, there's been some discussion, and so I thought, well, let me, uh, I would like to uh, just share a little bit more, maybe answer, try to answer some questions, although I don't have, I'll just tell you right now, some questions the answer is, I don't know, all right? As, am I allowed to say that? I don't know. And uh, I think there's something inherent in Jesus' instruction here that just goes so so cross of what we would think of on our own that uh, we have to stop and think and, and pray and, and sort out what Jesus, exactly what does that mean in this circumstance or in that one? And nonetheless, I want us to begin by, again, reading a few scriptures here. And let's begin in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And I'm not going to comment on these, I hope. I'll try not to. Uh, other than just read them, all right? Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 58, or 48, uh, to start out with. You have heard that it, was, that it is said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your enemy. Or, I'm sorry, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. So you may resemble your Father. For he makes... His son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? In other words, don't sinners even greet those who are kind to them? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect. That's perfect in love as your heavenly father is perfect. And then turn with me a few chapters later, chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18. And uh, I'm, I'm going to read the uh, end of this story and not the entire portion. I'm sorry, let me read the first two verses and then we'll go to the end. So begin in verse 21, Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Then Peter, Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Or we might say, Peter said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I have to forgive him? Uh, and he asked as many as seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, I do not like the ESV translation there, all right? So disregard that. It should be 70 times seven. Now, the Greek construction here in itself can be 77 or it can be 490. It can be 70 times seven or 70 plus seven. Uh, 
And we wouldn't know just from this context. But I pointed last week from Daniel chapter 9 that uh, it, it seems that it should be 70 times 7. And then go to the end and we find in verse 35, So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. And then turn with me finally to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 38. Luke chapter 6, 20, verse 27. But I say to you uh, who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, to one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also, for, and from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good. And lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. Or as Matthew said it, you will resemble your father. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your father is merciful. Judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it will be measured back to you. Some powerful scriptures. Some puzzling scriptures. Uh, some scriptures over which we may have stumbled uh, a few times, uh, perhaps in very recent days. Uh, some passages that are not common sense. Would you agree with me? Jesus is not sharing here what we might say is common sense. The common sense, he, he describes what is common sense. That is, what would a typical person, sinner out there do? Well, be kind to your neighbors and not so kind to your enemies. Uh, give to the one who you know will give back. Uh, be, you know, bless those who will bless you, right? Uh, that's what common sense is. So I've, I've, I've taken a number of questions. Some of these came from small group leaders. Some, some came from you uh, personally. Uh, others asked on behalf of somebody else perhaps. Uh, so let me, let me just raise these. Now, I have too many questions tonight, as you can imagine, to address uh, or to even try to. And I shouldn't even try to because I'm not the one to answer these. But let me answer a, a few of these. First of all, it, it, the question that comes up, is there, is there more context? Or what's the context for understanding uh, the pretty radical teaching that Jesus gives to us concerning forgiveness? Is there anything in the context that help us, helps us understand what Jesus means and how we may live this out today. So let me give you four quick points on that, all right? I don't have any PowerPoint. You can write these down if you want to. Four, four contextual points. Number one is the context is uh, the Beatitudes, all right? It's, it's the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. That's the context which Jesus gave on the occasion in which he addressed Pharisees and those who may have sat under their teaching, he, he addressed the Pharisaic understanding of what the law of God is. And he taught that the law of God is all about love, not hate. So the context is responding to a Pharisaic understanding. Really, let's just say it this way. The context is Jesus' sermon in response to common sense. The common sense of that day. Because he said, you've heard it said that you should love your neighbor but hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Do good to them and pray for them and bless them and so on. The second point of the context is this is in the context of the incarnation. This is Jesus, the Son of God, who is speaking here on earth. He doesn't have to be here. He doesn't have to come for us. He came because as... as uh, he said, in, as Luke wrote in Luke 6, he says, 
he, the father, is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. So Jesus is giving this message, radical message, in the context of doing something himself very radical. That is being here in the flesh. That means that he came for the sole purpose of suffering as an act of God to suffer on behalf of our forgiveness, to forgive us of our sins. So that's the second point of the context, the incarnation. Third, it's in the context of a call to radical discipleship. Jesus is calling us to radical discipleship. Did you notice in Luke chapter 6 that three times he says, if you, if you uh, love those who love you, what benefit is that? Sinners do that. He said, if you lend to those who you know will pay you back, what good is that? Sinners do that. If you, uh, uh, if you do good to those who do good to you, uh, what benefit is that? Sinners do that. So on three, three different examples there, what's he saying? He's saying, if you just do what is common sense, what the common sinner does, you are not going to stand out as my disciple. You will not be distinguished as my disciple. So the context is a radical call to discipleship. A call to radical discipleship. And as I was contemplating this this week, this thought came to, to me. That when we forgive others, we remind ourselves that we ourselves are forgiven. Right. When we forgive others, it is a reminder first to, to myself that I am living as a forgiven person. Let's not discount that. That's very much a part of the context. Then and third, the context is within a general biblical uh, worldview, and that is how do you overcome evil? How do you come, overcome uh, when, when evil is directed to you? How do you overcome it? And what did Paul say? What did the Apostle Paul say? What does Jesus say? He says, overcome evil with good. Always. The only way to put an end to evil is to overcome it with good. Evil in response to evil just perpetuates evil. And Jesus is showing us a more radical way. So those are some points of the context. And another question that was asked, is it always reasonable to turn the other cheek or to give more to a person than he has taken? Uh, this was asked several times in reference to, uh, to Matthew. And... Uh, Yeah, I don't want to break down the question too much, but it says, is it always reasonable? Is, is it always reasonable? Not in the reason of the world, no. It's not, is it? It seems very irrational. It seems, no, that's not, that, no, you wouldn't do that. Uh, and yet Jesus calls us to something that is uh, very uh, cross-grained with the way the world would live. But let me give you these. Let, let me, let's look at what Jesus is not saying, all right? What is Jesus not saying? And I have, I'll, sh I'll share several of these points. I have six here. I don't know if I'll share all six or not. We'll see. Number one, Jesus is not saying that when we forgive, that we are, that we should let evil prevail. He is not saying that we should let evil prevail. In other words, that evil just gets off scot-free. Cheap, cheap forgiveness, cheap grace. No, no, no. Grace is not cheap. What's the cost of grace? The cost of grace is the life of the incarnate Son of God. That's the, do, you think, do you think Jesus uh, gave his life thinking, uh, well, you know what? Um, I'm going to do this just to, as the, you know, the popular bumper sticker says, you know, I'm not perfect, just forgiven. Okay, that's baloney. Okay, Jesus did not come just to forgive us. He came to forgive us in order to begin a new work in us, to change us, fundamentally to change us. Forgiveness it doesn't just exist on itself. So uh, Jesus is not saying that we should let evil prevail, prevail or just continue unhindered. All right, so that's number one. Number two, Jesus is not saying that we should not, in, in our forgiveness, that we should not condemn evil, that we should not identify it. Call it out. 
Call it what it is. That's evil, and it's evil done to me, and I forgive that evil. I mean, I'll say this just in case I forget to say it later, although I have it in my notes several times. And that is this, that I think generally, and I'm, I'll just speak for myself in this case. Uh, let me make a few points here. Uh, number one, I think most offenses we can overlook. Most offenses are minor enough that they can be overlooked. However, there are some that cannot be, all right? So those offenses, I think most of us internalize forgiveness. In other words, we tell ourselves, I forgive them. I forgive him. I forgive her. But we never vocally f go to that person and forgive them. All right? I mean, I don't say we never do. I mean, there may be occasions. But I think m most of the time, people internalize. They, they tell themselves, I forgive them. And is that real forgiveness? Yes. I, I think that's forgiveness. I, th I think that's okay. And sometimes you ought to just keep it to yourself. But I wonder if there are situations in our lives where we actually need to vocalize forgiveness for the purpose of identifying the evil that's been done. All right, you understand what I'm saying? In other words, someone has taken advantage of you. Uh, several, uh, several of you uh, shared with me, uh, three or four at least, shared circumstances where someone took advantage of you financially. All right? And uh, it may be appropriate it may be appropriate to go to a person and say, you know what, I forgive you for taking advantage of me with this amount of money that you intended but have never paid back, <laughs> or whatever the case might be. I mean, it may be that you have to call out the evil that's been done as part of forgiveness. What are you doing? Are you doing it spitefully? No, you shouldn't do it spitefully, but you should do it not allow, for the purpose of not allowing evil to prevail. Uh, but also just not allowing evil to just get off the hook. And so Jesus is not saying that we should let evil prevail. Jesus is not saying that we should not condemn evil. And sometimes in our forgiveness, our forgiveness should include a condemnation of that evil. And then third, Jesus is never saying that we should never defend someone. Now, the question has been asked, there are a lot of articles written on this. Was Jesus a pacifist? He seems to, in all these passages, he seems to have really been a pretty pacifistic. That is, you know, never, never, uh, never be aggressive towards somebody else. Never, uh, you know, some would go to, to the extent of saying, you know, don't, don't ever fight, don't ever defend, don't ever, uh, you know, don't join the military, don't do anything, you know, don't own guns. There would be people who would say that. Uh, no, I don't think Jesus was a pacifist. I think he largely was. I, mean, I think he mostly was pacifist. But he wasn't always. Uh, in fact, in, in, uh, let's see, I think it's, uh, let me see here. Let me make sure I got the, got the right passage. Yeah, yeah, uh, turn with me to John chapter 2. So Jesus, uh, this is the third point under what Jesus is not saying, all right, if you're taking notes. Jesus is not saying that we should never defend someone. And in John chapter 2, Jesus shows, this is, the, this is the one occasion that I'm aware of where Jesus shows aggression. All right, you know the story. He's in the temple. Uh, the, the money changers, they're there. They're taking advantage of people and all this stuff. And uh, notice, notice what happens in, uh, in verse 15. Verse 15. Do you see this? John chapter 2 and verse 15. He drove them out, right? What did he do to prepare to drive them out? Do you see this? Somebody tell me. What did they do to prepare? What did he do to prepare to drive them out? It says that he made a whip of cords. So Jesus prepared. All right. He prepared, took these cords, took the time. I don't know how long it would take. It would take a little while to make a whip, right? I mean, he's thinking, I'm going to use this thing. I mean, the whole time he's braiding this thing together, thinking, I'm going to use this. I'm, I'm building me a weapon. All right? You, you, are you with me? Jesus showed aggression. Why did he show aggression? He went in, and this is what he said. Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. He went in to defend the honor of his father. Jesus lone act, recorded act of aggression was to the defense of another, that is his father. 
Now, I, I, I told the small group leaders tonight as we were talking about this and reflecting, I'm not prepared this evening to go through the various scriptures, but there are various scriptures that, that we could find uh, where we are called to defend one another. What Jesus taught us in these passages that we've looked at is to relinquish defense to God ultimately. But I think in order to create an atmosphere and an environment in which evil does not prevail and in which forgiveness can, I think that believers, I think, again, I speak to myself, that I need to do a better job, Christians need to do a better job of defending each other. Defending each other. Now, don't go home and start braiding your, your whip, all right? Uh, but I, I do think that there's a place for, de for defense, but the Proverbs has something to say about this as well, that we, we should leave the defense of ourselves in the hands of others. Let someone else defend us. And I think there's something to that. It may be in a conversation that you need to just stop it and say, well, hey, you know what? In fact, I, I can think of a conversation right now that I had. A, there's a, someone was speaking about another pastor, a friend of mine, and who had made some mistakes. And I stopped right then and I said, you know what? That man's my friend. We don't deny his mistakes, but that man's my friend. And I, I will not sit here and, and, and just listen to this. Rehash. I will not. And some, maybe you have to do that. Come to the defense of somebody. Uh, it may even be physical at times. Uh, there may be times where you have to intervene. Uh, someone, uh, I think uh, Sister uh, Betty was saying, you know, the one thing that she just cannot stand to see, and, um, and same here, being a school administrator, is, is bullying. I don't like bullying. I don't like to see someone being bullied. And man, if there's ever a, a sense within me of justice, like when I see a, one kid picking on another, I want to go up there and wring his neck and start braiding, I just start braiding my whip, I guess. Uh, that might become a, a thing. Uh, right? I mean, there are certain things that just, we get that. And, and you know what? There's, I, I, I think that's a sense of justice. We want justice to prevail. And I, do think, I don't think Jesus is saying that we should never defend someone else. All right, fourth, Jesus is not saying that we should never walk away from a situation. Now, I know in Matthew chapter 5, he said, walk a mile, walk two miles, go the extra mile. Uh, but he does speak elsewhere in the gospel. Again, I don't, I'm not prepared to go through all the scriptures this evening, but you can ask me later if you wish. But he does, on two or three occasions, he does identify situations where he instructs his followers to, to walk away. We don't know all the details of the circumstance, but we know that there are times when that happens. Uh, and then number five, Jesus is not saying that we should avoid the truth. That goes with really the condemnation of evil as well, but that we should ignore the truth or avoid it. And finally, six, Jesus is not saying that we should not seek justice. Forgiveness is in order for justice to prevail. Because God ultimately uh, wants, uh, he will bring justice. Now, uh, let me, let me, uh, this came up a, a couple of times. And, uh, and then doing some reading, I found that actually this, there are others who have written on forgiveness who actually take this, and I, I totally disagree. And that is, uh, the question that comes up is, you know, Luke chapter 6 is pretty radical. You know, that list of things he tells us to do. Uh, isn't Jesus using hyperbole? Isn't he just kind of, you know, hyperbole is, you know, you, you state things, but you don't mean them literally. You don't, you know, you, you overstate something. And I, I say with all my heart, no, Jesus is not using hyperbole. The way I know that is because three times again he says, anything less than this, and you're just as good as any other common sinner. So Jesus is not using hyperbole when he says, do good to those who hate you. All right? That, there's nothing hyperbolic about that. There's nothing hyperbolic about loving your enemies. Okay? That's not. Uh, on John Piper's website, uh, I don't know who the author was. John doesn't write everything that's on there, but uh, I'm sure that he has con good control of what is there. But he takes the position that's hyperbole. I totally disagree. I think Jesus is teaching a, a radical discipleship. 
that he means exactly what he says, exactly the way he says it. Now, this does not mean, this does not mean that he's stating things in principle. It doesn't mean that he's not doing that. He is making statements here that are in principle. So, uh, someone asked this. Uh, it says to be merciful as our Father is merciful. To be merciful to the one who's not been merciful to us. What's it mean to be merciful? Uh, let me just give you this really simple definition based on how Jesus uses the word here, all right? It is simply this. To be merciful means to show, it's an outward act, to show undeserved kindness. It's to show undeserved kindness. Key, key words, undeserved and kindness. This person doesn't deserve it, but I will show it. Someone asked also, uh, can this be shown from a distance? Uh, there are many circumstances that we can think of. In fact, you may be in a circumstance right now where it's far, it, 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 far better, given the circumstances, for you to show kindness from a distance and not on the doorstep. All right? There, there may, you may be in a circumstance. Uh, Jesus, uh, in, in going through here, uh, in, in many of these commands, uh, doesn't say you have to move in next door to the person who harmed you. He doesn't say that, all right? You can show kindness from a distance. And, uh, and, and people have come to me. I've had several uh, uh, circumstances that people have brought to me and said, what about this circumstance? What about that? And I said, I don't know. I just, first of all, pray for your enemies. Uh, that's, that's an easy, easy first step. Uh, we, have to, we have to personally seek God's guidance uh, again, as followers of Christ, right, we do this as followers of Christ, saying, Jesus, I want to follow you in, in this, but there's this circumstance or maybe multiple circumstances in my life. Show me what it means to, to bless my enemy. Show me what it means to, to do good to those who have shown evil to me. And, uh, and then just uh, allow God to show you, all right? Allow Jesus to lead you because he's, he's the one that gave us the instruction, you, know, he th you think he's just going to leave us out here hanging uh, and uh, with all these questions? Well, he may not answer all of them, but, uh, but I think he will help us. That's why he's given us his Holy Spirit to teach us. Another question, I'm in Luke 6. Uh, and let me just point this scripture out. L let me look at, let's look at Luke chapter 6, verse 35. Because I think this gets to the main point. The main point of what Jesus is saying here. And he says here, love your enemies, do good, lend, expect nothing in return, and your reward will be great. So there, and you will be sons of the Most High. I think there are two points here. That what makes a follower of Christ, what makes Christ stand out, all right? What makes Jesus stand out? Is the same thing that ought to make us stand out. And that is that we love those who are really unlovable, those who do not love us back. We love them expecting nothing in return. We love them for no reason other than that Jesus loves them. We don't love them because they've harmed us. We don't love them because... Um, of anything we particularly like about them. We don't love them because uh, we want to be really close to them. We don't love them because we get some sort of uh, you know, nice feelings toward them. No, we probably don't get any of that, all right, in many cases. We love them because Jesus loves them. Expect nothing in return. That's number one. Number two, your reward will be great. So God is taking note. Take note of that. We love them because God loves them. And in that you will be the sons of the Most High. So in other words, I love them because Jesus loves them. I love them because I want to resemble my Father. I will forgive when it's difficult to do. I will love and bless. I will walk a second mile because I want to resemble my Father. Remember, when we forgive, we remind ourselves first and foremost, ourselves, that we are forgiven. We are forgiven people. All right, uh, I, other questions. Um, do I have to forgive someone if they don't ask for it? Uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, 
the answer is yes. Uh, you have to forgive. Jesus tells us that. But it raises up another issue. Did, we, we need to recognize that just because you forgive someone doesn't mean that the relationship will be reconciled. You cannot single-handedly reconcile a relationship. Relationships are two people. And, it, and, and you have been, many of us have been in relationships that perhaps today are unreconciled. Does that mean there's unforgiveness? No, it doesn't. You, you may have forgiven that, that person, but that relationship is still broken. And there may not be anything that you can do. I mean, you can, you can bless them as often as you want, and they may just continue to refuse reconciliation. You cannot, so forgiveness does not guarantee reconciliation. Uh, I know you found that out already. That's not new news to you, right? You've already figured that out. Is forgiveness letting it go? That's kind of a big phrase, right? Ever since the Disney movie, whatever that one was called, you know, that song, let it go, right? Let it go, just let it go. Uh, I don't even know exactly what all that means, but let it go. Um, no, I don't, I, don't think, I don't think forgiveness is just, quote, letting it go. As if letting it go means just forget it, just, just, just forget it. No, you can't forget stuff. Right. In fact, the things that are probably most easily to be remembered are the are the negative things. Right. You can't just let go. And you know what? That what one of the uh, to me, I find it comforting. Hopefully, you find it comforting as well. We'll talk about this when we get to heaven and hell. But uh, there, there will be memory in heaven. Okay. There will be memory in heaven. You say, "Oh, well, that's bad news." Uh, no, there will be memory in heaven. Why? How do I know that? Because the psalmist, especially, but in the New Testament as well, talks about how the redeemed will sing. We will sing the songs of redemption. We will praise the Lamb for redemption. Well, if we have no memory, how will we be able to sing a song of redemption? Redemption from sin. Uh, but there's something about. In fact, let me share this little illustration. Then I'll, I think I'll have to close. But. Uh, there is a, I don't remember what it's called, but a, a series of stories of, of people who, who survived just, uh, just tremendous tragedies or, or uh, incidents, all right? Uh, they didn't die, obviously, but they, they survived it. And one of the stories, uh, a man was in not one, but two plane crashes in a single day, all right? He was flying a little airplane out in Colorado, uh, they, because they were in this valley, the, the wind and something, something happened, and they crashed. They survived. All three passengers, they survived. And uh, the military sent a helicopter down through here. They, uh, two of the guys walked back to a town, and this guy was here. They, they put him on the helicopter, and the helicopter started taking off, and it got something happened again. That something about this valley just was weird, and the helicopter crashed. And he survived that again. And and so someone had to come and rescue them. And he said, I thought it was, okay, listen, this is his testimony. His testimony was, I thought it was the greatest day of my life when I saw the rescuers coming in their ATVs, and I knew that I was saved. He said, I have never felt so happy in my, he just went through two plane crashes. What do you mean you've never felt happier than you did in that moment? You understand? The depths of the, the hurt and, and everything he'd been through, and then it made the heights of his salvation greater. And I think that's how we ought to think about singing the song of redemption. I think that's how we ought to think about the memory of, wow, we, we've been saved from that. And uh, so that's not, you know, yeah, that's not, you know, let's just try to wipe our, our memory clean. Uh, yeah, I know. There are a lot of things we wish hadn't happened. It doesn't mean those things were, were good. It doesn't mean that, uh, oh, man, I'm so glad that happened. I feel so much better because of it. No, it doesn't mean that at all. But it makes the experience of salvation, uh, in his words, so much happier, right? As uh, Jesus said, the one who has been forgiven much uh, will, will, will give much praise, will give much thanks as well. A lot more questions. Uh, wow. Uh, Jesus, Jesus, he raised questions. And at the, bottom, at the end of the day, I, I read this and I say, you know what? Um, I would never. I mean, if, if I were the one writing a, a manual for how to live by, I would never have come up with this. 
I would never have come up with this. Something else. Uh, we've come up with something else. And you wouldn't have either. But Jesus did. And we have to come back to the Word. Every single time, we have to come back. And uh, in, in almost all the conversations, I come back to saying, you know what? Uh, this is what Jesus said. It's not what I said. Because I can assure you, I'd say something different. All right? If it was just out of my own brain, I'd say something different. But Jesus said these things. And uh, because he said it and invites me to follow after him, I'm going to set my mind to try to, to live out as best as I can with imperfect understanding, for certain, and probably with imperfect practice. Won't get everything right. But he says here, oh, let me close with this. All right, Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse 40. All right, we'll conclude with this. I'll just read this. In fact, you can stand. That, that way you know that we're really done. All right, that's kind of the sign, right? We're really done. All right, Luke chapter 6, verse 40. says, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, I want to be fully trained. I'm not there yet. But everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. What will we be like when we're like Jesus? God help us. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, we are stumbling all over it. We are... Uh, doing some hard work trying to sort out how in the world to live out radical discipleship. Uh, but we're glad that you gave us the Holy Spirit. Wow, do we ever, are we ever cognizant of our need for the Holy Spirit to teach us all things, as you said he would. Uh, so Lord, teach us this. Uh, lessons we really probably may prefer not to learn because it means difficulty. But uh, Things have happened already, and we want to learn these so we can follow you. We want to be like our teacher. We want to be like our master. So do that. We give you, we give you full right. We, we give you, uh, we, we entirely sanctify our lives to you. We, we set apart a whole life, mind, body, and soul to you, saying, Lord, uh, teach and instruct us. Uh, you, have, you have our fullness, and uh, have your way in us, we pray. Would you be with us through this week, and bless our groups that meet midweek, and the ministries that take place. Uh, would you honor those we ask in Jesus' name? Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.